support for this episode of the PowerCast comes from Reebok, home of the Legacy Lifter at Reebok.com. Ape Man Apparel for people who lift heavy weights at ApeManStrong.com. Complex Muscle Stim Products at ComplexUSA.com. Use the code POWERCAST and get an additional 28% discount. HowMuchShebench.net, home of Mark Bell's Slingshot. Use the code POWERCAST and get 15% off slingshots and free shipping on orders of 100 bucks or more. And Bodybuilding.com, the world's largest fitness website and supplement store. Bodybuilding.com has free plans for every level. Visit Bodybuilding.com today to become your best self. Recorded live in West Sacramento, California, this is Mark Bell's PowerCast. Standing just to the left of Jim McDean, here's your host, Mark Bell. We're going to pick this one up right where we left off. And try to hit up a few more questions here. Yeah, there's uh, there's a fifty something questions. The I'm trying poop, to like cull here. Poop load. The, the uh, protocol for uh, this this bench squat deadlift in terms of speed, like eight sets of three, eight sets oh. of two, eight sets of one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you want to vary it, but you don't want to do any less than six, or you're not going to get enough volume and dynamics to get faster. And you don't want to do any more than eight to ten, or you're going to start getting to that thirty three percent pie chart. And you're going to have to take energy away from maxing or repetition work. So the point is, optimi- you try to optimize each area. And in my opinion, the optimal range on speed is six, six to ten. Like, and, and play with it. You know, sometimes nine, sometimes six, sometimes seven. Um, but the real key is making sure that it's separate enough from the the mat. You know, if you look at your force equals m times a equation, the key is you want to focus the a, not the m. So don't focus so much on the mass. I look at it from two different ways. The acceleration training is like getting hit with a 50 cal bullet at 3,000 meters per second. That's not a big piece of metal. If it hits you at 3,000 meters per second, it's going to fucking blow your body in half. (laughs) Conversely, on the other side, maxing is like getting hit five miles an hour by the fucking 50,000 pound dump truck. Right? It's going to hit you and it's not going to stop for a while because it takes a while to stop it. Point is, they have to be separate. They have to almost be that separate in order to do them constantly over long periods of time. You have to have a day that's massive acceleration and a day that's maximal weights. If you start making acceleration look too much like max effort day, get too close to those percentage ranges, it's going to wear you down and actually cause you to overtrain. Gotcha. So deadlift six to eight sets of one yeah. to two reps. And, and like the that. deadlift is the one that's the most variable. It's usually a minimal of six, but I've started to learn that I needed to do on deadlifts for me personally, I needed to do twos or threes for speed and I needed to slow the eccentric down to build more muscle because mm-hmm. I'm very explosive by nature, yeah. but my weakness in my deadlift is the ability to grind out big weights. And as you get older, you don't have that same speed. I think the eccentric too being slowed down will get you in better positions. Well, you know, you're going to uh, oh, find because yeah. you can use the weight as a counterbalance. So right now, spot. Eddie's giving me a lot of advice. So when I do my, remember we were talking about doing like not a burnout set, but very high reps on your last right. set of, of speed day mm-hmm. or max day and lower it right. down. So I did 405 for 20. I posted on Instagram. Um, and the point is, is that I'm lowering that with control and I'm barely letting it touch the ground so I can't loosen up. Mm. So now the time under tension is fucking insane. Yeah. Jesse Burdick has done that for years where he takes the, he usually has like a percentage. Sometimes he'll do it even on max effort day, yep. but at max effort or dynamic effort day, he'll kind of take a number, uh, you know, off of whatever it is that you lifted. Mm-hmm. And he might have you do on a ma- on a dynamic day, might have you do like 20 reps. And on yep. a max effort day, he might just have you kind of double the rep protocol. So yep. if you did one rep or three reps. Do six he, or eight or whatever. Yeah, he might have you kind of bounce up I, I think a good range. rule of thumb for that type of shit's below 50%. 50% right. is kind of the range. So I did 405 for right at 20. I can deadlift 800. Yeah. Mm. So that, that was sucked. How many seconds do you think that was worth? You know, I, I probably took seconds. me about probably 40, 40 seconds to 55. Because you're going slow on the eccentric. Yeah. That's bru- That's a Yeah, and it's steady on the eccentric. Yeah. Now, you can change the speed. It's so a lot of grip work, too. You're yeah, getting a lot. Tons a lot of, of work. grip work. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I'll use straps on that just, just to give my hands a break. Because you're the problem is, it for an hour. in a day yeah. and a half, I got a fucking bench heavy. Right. So it's always cumulative. And I think that's where people screw up. It's not how much you can do in a day. It's how much you can do in 30 days. 
Mm-hmm. So if I go too hard where I got to back off the next workout, it's not a good it's not a good workout. And what can you recover from? Yeah, and what can you recover from? And a lot of that comes from uh, you know, being successful in the gym has a lot to do with what you're doing outside of the gym. Right. Are you eating correctly? And most importantly, as a strength athlete, are you sleeping enough? And is your sleep quality or, or are you so fucking fat you're on a sleep app machine? You know what I mean? You don't yeah. you don't get good REM and sleep. Then- your fucking nutri- nutrients are all off. These are things that I'm learning right before I get too old, but it's <laughs> completely yeah. changed my life the last three or four years being around Charles Poliquin and um, Eric Serrano and Charles those guys. Charles Poliquin is like, he knows so much shit. He knows, he knows more He knows more in like 10 minutes than most people will ever when learn he, their whole when life. When he was here, like when he, when he left, I was like, I was almost thinking to myself, like, it sucks that like there's... There's there's nobody else in the world like that guy. No. And I was thinking to myself, like, when that guy passes on, he can't, like, no one else can, like, take on all that information. So, like, no. when he's gone, he's gone, and there's only, yeah. like, one version no. of him. Yeah, there's only one version of him, and he's kind of he's kind of a recluse in that yeah. aspect, you know. He has, like, seven languages and shit. He's yeah. Fucking I mean, it was so much fun traveling over Europe and doing all those seminars with him yeah. because he he did the seminars on the fly. So there was no notes. There was no anything. He, he did it off the top, off of, his the top of his head, basically like we, me and you talk shit. But what I noticed was is that he would tell these different groups different shit based on what he came up with that day, like mm-hmm. what he knew. That's how much shit he knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in three seminars that we ran, me and him and Ed Cohen did in Amsterdam and Toronto and Prague, I learned three different whole days of, uh, you know, multiple days, but three different whole seminars of different things based yeah. on what he wanted what he wanted to talk about that day. And he's talking about like, you know, taking in three grams of fucking mushroom extract to burn <laughs> fat on your well, whatever yeah. the fuck. You're like, oh, yeah. what the hell? And anybody listening to this on. was something that helped me a lot. So the first two times I dieted, I would get major fucking carb cravings. One, because I had to weigh 315 back mm-hmm. in the day. So I had to eat everything in sight so my body got used to that. That was part of the problem. But after the third time dieting, I could not figure out why I would just crave fucking, like, sugar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I started talking to Charles, and the first time I started hanging out with him, he goes, you know, he's like, oh, you're magnesium deficient. And I'm like, what the fuck? Right? I don't don't know anything about that, and I got a fucking master's. it sounds like bullshit right away. You're like, magnesium, fuck that. So he he gave me a protocol to take magnesium. I was taking, I want to say... 2,000 milligrams a Not day. Not magnesium mm-hmm. citrate. No, yeah. glycinate. <laughs> if you take citrate, you're going to blow your fucking ass out. Boom. It's gone. But um, I started to notice once that magnesium kicked in, my carbohydrate cravings were fucking gone oh, because really? my insulin was all over the place. And magnesium glycinate actually helps control insulin Bodies. response. Yeah, that's crazy. I was like, fuck, man. If I'd have known that five years ago. Yeah. You know, I'd have been a lot leaner, a For lot me, faster. For me, that's a big reason why I just cut carbs. It makes things easier because... It, when I don't have them, I don't crave them. Yeah. You know? But when I have them, then that's when it gets kind of ups and yeah. downs. And I'm thinking about pizza and everything else. He said something when he was here that that like I think we should say it on every fucking show is that when you eat something that you want to eat, you immediately feel better. Yeah. Like if you're like emotionally, physically, Dopamine. whatever, you feel great mm-hmm. for a short period of time, but you instantly feel better. So yeah. of course, it's always going to be a draw yeah. to eat the things that you you probably shouldn't eat because. Yeah. Well, you get a dopamine high from it. Yeah. And, you, and a lot of that's because you know it's it's like, why do people that have millions of dollars still deal still deal drugs? <laughs> because they not only make money off that, they get a fucking high off of it because right. it's illegal. Right. right. You know? And like exactly. if you're, you know, everybody wants real. to be a gangster because a gangster is illegal. You right. know what I mean? And that's the thing is, is, is that you get a dopamine high off of that shit. And that's what the the food companies know so that's why it's right. packed shit full of fat and sugar right. because you get a dopamine response when you eat it and that's why we have a fucking obesity rate this <laughs> yeah. is insane everybody's you know? fucking but that's what fat. that's what has that's what keeps my job with the fire departments right 50 60 years and we've talked about this but 50 60 years ago you could have got away with being an average strength joe and be a fireman mm-hmm. you know why because the average body weight was 155 pounds right mm-hmm. You know, a, nar- a normal dude can grab 155 pounds and move it if he has to. I'm not saying you have to be insanely strong. The average fucking weight is not that anymore. And there's multiple 300 plus pound people in the grocery store right now. So who do you think are the ones getting the diabetic runs, stroke yeah. runs, mm. right? All these problems 
The point is, is that now to be a fireman in this day and age in the United States, you have to be double the strength that you were 50 years ago because people are double the weight. Mm. I mean, back 50 years ago, if you ran into a 300 pound man, that was that was a fucking huge dude. Right now, me and Mark Bell walk in and obviously our stature is different. We have mm. more muscle, mm. but we are not the heaviest person at the grocery store anymore. <laughs> right. But 50 years ago, you would have been the heaviest guy in the fucking city. Yeah. 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 You the know, town's ever seen. Just right? look at pro football. Yeah. yeah. 1969. The average lineman was what two sixty, and that those were the biggest fucking dudes. Yeah, and in the for United. a while it got up to three sixty, and now they're kind of like leaning know, out back, a little more. But that's middle. my point: is the fire service guys are heavier, and now our military guys are heavier because one, they come in heavier to the army. They have less. They have less so body I'm sure fat. They're getting injured when they're not in shape and they're fat and they're trying to lose well, weight. Well, where the army where the army really fucks up is they try to use a fifty year old system to get guys in shape, but when they come in. They're higher body fat and less muscle mass and less bone density because we don't even have gym classes. Yeah. So the problem is now is that strength training is even more vital to the system right. because they have to be able to withstand impact. Well, and the only way to do that. They strip body fat off them, but they're still making them weak. Yes. Right. They're, they're right. getting in better right. condition. They're, they're breaking cool. them down. They're making them skinny they fat. Yeah. Right. Every military guy that I grab that just does military shit, they're skinny fat. You know what I mean? And soft. that's the thing is they're soft, they're weak. And if you're soft and weak, that means your bones suck. So impactive injuries are insane right now in the military because you don't have any muscle. If you have a high muscle mass, there's no way you don't have strong bones. Right. I guess that makes sense. Um, cause yeah, it, it's you, all, you, it's relative. Yeah, because you're, you're building up the bone Muscle density. pulls on yeah. bone, bone gets stronger. Yeah. That was actually one of the questions was um, uh, getting prepared for uh, spec ops uh, selection process. Yep. All right. Well, spec ops is a little bit different because the first thing they're going to do, depending on where you uh, where where you go to, is they're just going to see how tough you are. Yeah. So, the, so there's a mental process that you can't really. I'm more. I'm. I would say I'm more of a specialist of not prepping guys for that. Is keeping them in it. Right. Oh, yeah. Because the thing of it is, is you can't train for stupidity. I mean, no. like when those guys go and like try out for Ranger Regiment, right. it's 60 days of starvation, wake you up at 3 in the morning and run your ass off. There's no training for that. You just have to be a tough motherfucker. But what I try to do with the Army is once they've already found the tough guys, now it's time to train smart. Mm -hmm. And a lot of problems is they think they need to keep doing that, and you don't. You've already, you've already filtered you, you're out already, the week. You've already gone through that gauntlet. So what you have to find out is if you're, if you're training for special ops, you just need to be tough as nails. If you're tough as nails, you'll get through whatever they tell you to get through. There's no training for it. But once you're in, then you have to change gears to doing it very, very smart and making sure you're strong, balanced, coordinated, and that you don't have any weak weak links in your muscles. So that way when you go to max strain or whatever, you're not fucking yourself up. And part of that mental toughness, too, is going to be engaging in some sort of training before you get there so you're not so out of shape. That, oh, yeah, for sure. fatigue makes cowards of us all. But if a, guy's, if a guy's said, probably, yeah. if a guy's probably uh, insinuating that he's going to go special ops, he's probably already in fairly good shape yeah. anyway. Yeah. You're not going to be some average jackass and go, hey, I want to go try out for special forces. <laughs> yeah. They're not even going to let you try yeah. out. Yeah. They're so gonna, like, I think worthless. if you're already trying out for special ops, then you're probably, um, you probably need to make sure that you're just healthy. Because I'm sure that you're probably already in shape. You got to go in 100% healthy because when you leave, you're going to be 50% unhealthy. Then after that point, you got to train smart. Uh, jumping back to dynamic work, somebody was asking Kevin Ray Parsons asking if you're using if you're varying your grip during uh, bench training, dynamic bench training. Always. So the key with bench training is you need to be strong at all positions. So I find that most people look better a little wider. They need to look better a little narrower. You need to increase the stroke range. So the point, you know, we'd all like to increase the strength range, right? <laughs> hey now. But the point is, is that you want your hands, you want your hands in a position you're getting the most work. Mm -hmm. If you go wider where your bench stroke is shorter, it's bullshit. So I think if you look at me, I got pretty wide shoulders and my, I can always see the rings inside my hands mm -hmm. or the, the rings outside of my hand. Yeah. So that means it's pretty fucking narrow, but I'm getting more work there. And then when I move that grip out just a half an inch, I'm a six, 600 plus bencher. Right. But I train, I, I and, and my... Um, experience, I always find that people tend to do it too wide. You need to be able to see the rings unless you're fucking Bill Kazmaier. Then you can put your hands, you know, you can cover the ring. Yeah. But that's because his shoulders are so wide. Yeah, he's huge. So the key is have, have a grip most of the time that's straight up and down, not out, not out. So, uh, you know, in your career, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, squatting over 800 pounds in 2003. It's now 2017. I think in maybe 2015 or 14 or so, you squatted 
maybe like 865 or so. I did 832 to take the world record from in, Scott Weech in 2000, end of 14, or the beginning of 14, yeah. the end of 13 at so uh, been, Raw Unity. And then I did 865 the year after that. So I tried 903. I got 840. So I did 832, then I did 844. And then I tried 903 that meet and barely missed it, which I was fucking pissed. Because it's the only squad I ever took out yeah. that I had on my back and goes, holy shit, I got this. Yeah. Like, I picked it up and it literally, I don't know what I did that training cycle, but 903 felt like 500 on my back. Nice. I was like, oh, damn. So I, I went down and then it, then it checked me. You know, I got down to the bottom and I dropped too fast because I was too confident. And then when I went to turn it back up, that 900 wasn't 900 anymore because it was accelerating down. Yeah. I should have slowed it down a little. Maybe just lost a tiny bit of yeah, position somewhere. Yeah, so that was, that was Raw Unity 15. And then 2016, I squatted 865.5, which I believe at that time was the seventh highest squat ever done. And, and, I, only, and I weighed 291. So I wasn't 315 right. or 330. And I'm six foot tall. So that's a long-ass fucking stroke, you know? Yeah, you're smashing all these big weights for, for so many years. Um and then the bench too, benching over 600 pounds for, for years and years. Um, what is, what's holding you together? You know, you mentioned the max effort method, the repetition effort method, the dynamic method. Are those three things combining together to kind of hold you together? Is there something else going on? Or? So that's a separate, that's a separate board. I mean, like when you look at, when I started describing max effort and dynamics and speed, that's how you lay out your graph of training. The other side is, what do you need? And that's where I think the graph side is mostly fucked up. I realize that for me to bench that, my rear delts, scapular muscles, uh, rotator cuffs have to be insanely strong. So as you would think, well, I, I bench. I need to have huge pecs. I need to have huge shoulders. Mm -hmm. Those come secondarily to the thought processes. What allows me to have big pecs and shoulders is that my back holds that kind of weight. So I let the, I let the muscles that most people would normally – train to think that that's going to raise your lift and I reverse it and do the other muscles and let those grow on their own. Mm. So my point is I'm always conscious of my weakest links. That's held me together. And I base my training of what I do in those ranges of 33%. I base my training on those muscle groups. So 30% of my training would be based on what normal people would think. And then the other 70 is con is completely based on my weakest links. Kind of unconventional stuff. You mentioned uh, in the past doing a, a lot of reps of tricep work to basically make your triceps dominate your workout. Yes. Yeah, so you have to have a lot of volume, not necessarily intensity, a lot of volume to change motor patterns. So uh, most people, if you lay somebody down on a bench press and you say, and they have no experience and you just the bar, I guarantee fucking to you, they're going to use their anterior delt and their pec to do it. Yeah, a lot of shoulder. Yeah. And we ask ourselves why though, <clears throat> because the anterior delt, is used every fucking day thousands of times. So the brain connection to it is high. So how do you get the other muscles to function? You make the brain have to function those muscles at a high rate constantly. So I do probably upwards of 500 to 750 some type of arm extension every fucking week. And the reason is, is I don't want my, sh when I go to max, I do not want my shoulder and my pec to tell it to, hey, use these. These are the strongest. Mm. I want my brain to go, hey, Use these fucking triceps because they're going to stay on. You know what I mean? So the key is, is let you have to secondarily let the muscles that most people think are doing the work, you have to balance it with the antagonist muscle and make sure that it can withstand the pressures. And then you tell those muscles to help um, not over dominate, but at least be right. a key player. It makes a lot of sense. We're going to get a ton of stimulus from even just bench pressing by itself. Yeah. Your, your pecs and shoulders um, and just from – you know, doing bro workouts and uh, cable crossovers mm -hmm. and dumbbells. Those are all awesome exercises. Push-ups, they're all great, but you're going to get a yeah. lot of front delt and pec yeah. work. So your point is make sure you're training the backside of your body. Make sure you're yep. training the triceps, the rear delts, yep. rotator cuffs, because that's going to ultimately be the glue that's going to hold everything. Yeah, together. it's the glue. And the other thing I think you have to be concerned with is – you have to understand that in a normal day process for most people in their jobs, at school, whatever that may be, everything you're doing in your whole day is anterior. Show me somebody that's walking backwards down the street. <laughs> yeah, like this, right? Show somebody that their job is behind them. Yeah. It's not happening. So the, the only thing or the one thing you have to keep in mind, too, is that your daily activity is anterior. You don't, the 80-year-old lady you see walking in the grocery that's all bent over, she didn't get that way from fucking squats. She got that way from gravity pushing her down at nine point, 
you know, 71 meters per second all fucking day mm. without doing anything to reverse it. So what do you think happens to the average bro guy that's doing thousands and thousands of reps of flies and then not really double countering it with their back muscles, they're going to increase that speed of getting mm -hmm. fucked up posture even faster. Eating uh, on your phone, a lot yeah. of that's Computer, crumpled over, yeah. you know. Computer. Sitting. Writing papers in school. Here's the point. The point is, is not when you train like a power lifter or a bench presser or a cross, whatever you do, you're increasing more anterior pressure. So that means that you even have to be more cautious with making sure the posterior side not only gets double the work you're doing in the gym, but in life. So what I try to calculate is how much volume am I doing in my workout anteriorly, mm -hmm. and I double that volume for the backside. I don't care if it's fucking squats, bench, anything. If I'm doing something that my quads are burning, the hamstrings are going to get fucking killed that day right. because I want the balance and the Russians talked about in the 50s and 60s all the time of a one-to-one -one ratio from anterior to posterior. And here's where it makes the most sense. You think about a bench press. You're going to use the bar. You're going to use 95, 130, however your warm-up is, right? Yeah. For somebody that benches 400 pounds, you're going to spend 15 minutes, and you're going to do multiple sets just to get to that normally. You yep. know, some people like to warm up faster, but normally you're going to take some time to warm up to that 405. Yep. When you do some back work, you don't do nearly the amount of work. No. You, you you do a set. You do kind of, I call it a garbage set. You do one set to get a feel for it, make sure you're not going to tear anything for the day. Yep. Get your body a little warm, and then you're off to the races, and you do like three or four sets. Yep. Whereas on the bench, if you really add it up from that first set that you thousands did. Thousands of pounds. Touch, yeah. Thousands so, of pounds. So you do a lot of seminars like I do, and I've probably been in charge of more military guys, but you probably see more CrossFit people and stuff that I do. Yeah. How many people that are really big into working out do you know can bench press 250 and can't do a fucking pull-up? I know a bunch. Yeah. Yeah, that actually makes a and lot of sense. And think about it. That it, You know, the one thing that I learned at my local YMCA, sense, and my guys didn't fucking know <laughs> that taught me how to lift. They were strong. So the guy that taught me how to bench was a guy named Tim Smith out of Muncie, Indiana, and he had a 500-pound bench at 185 body weight. That's the dude I learned from. So I got desensitized to weights big time. But you know what he taught me? And he didn't even know why he was doing it. And he didn't know injury prevention. Or he was just a meathead. He goes, you're not allowed to bench with me until you can do a pull-up. So when I was a kid, I had to be able to do a pull-up before I could bench with him. <laughs> so what do you do? He had me on the pull-up machine. We had the ones, the stacks that lighten you yeah. up. And he worked me up until I could do a pull-up. And then he let me bench with him. Never had a shoulder problem. <laughs> wow. But he didn't know – he just wanted to do it to make me prove that I was going to work hard because he right. thought, well, this is a big kid. He can't do a fucking pull-up. Let's see if he really wants this. Yeah. That's why he did it. But in reality, what he, he was actually smarter than he knew because what he was doing is making my back strong before my front. Right. So now that I can do sense. 15, 20 pull-ups with shit around my neck. Nice. You what know about, what I mean? What about balancing things out, you know? Um Obviously, squats, you're going to get a lot of quad work, so yep. you can go uh, go nuts on your hamstrings with a bunch of different mm -hmm. exercises. But what about, you know, kind of balancing things out? And, and uh, you know, for me, I've had lots of elbow, and yep. I've had a bunch of different shit happen. What By about the way, kind of I, I, one of my favorite things you ever did was that fuck your elbow piece. <laughs> that was like, dude, when you did that, I was like, oh, my God, this is fucking amazing. I love that shit. Because it was just hardcore as fuck, man, but it was awesome. All right, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're on a real rant. my way to the gym and just started thinking about um, some, some people that they're always complaining about not making gains or you know I wish I, I want to look like them or I want to look like her or I want to be as strong as him or look like him well those hims and hers that you're talking about I guarantee you they're not making excuses like you are about going to the gym and eating right and all these other things the difference is they still, they still have those cravings and those urges to sit on their butt at home. The difference is they're mentally tough enough to get off the couch and get to the gym and push themselves. Fuck yeah! That's the difference in getting to where you want to be and talking about it. It's your choice. Finish what you start. That's how it works the shirt. Finish what you start. Don't just do this. Have some action behind it. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you balance that? So do you do, you do some bicep work? Because, you know, you're obviously if you're going to do a lot of back work, there's a lot of pulling involved. So maybe you don't need a ton of direct bicep work. Off, se off season. So in the back work, the back work takes care of the biceps probably 20 weeks of the year. The other 20 weeks of the year, I actually do biceps in a supinated hand position of palm up 
to maintain flexibility for the deadlift. Right. Because as you get bigger and thicker, you know yeah. this, it's harder to grab yeah. the bar underhand because yeah, somebody your pack, gives you change and you're like, I don't even fucking want it because you can't figure out how yeah, to do it. Yeah, oh, dude, when I go to the <laughs> drive throughs and shit, they <laughs> look like, at me oh. like I'm fucking disabled. You yeah. know what I mean? You're like, kind of. Yeah. I got hit by a mortar over like, in Iraq. Throw, you know? <laughs> throw, it, throw it, Mike. Just throw the change at me. Throw it in the but I, can, I think the easiest way to answer that question is kind of tell you what I do. So... When I go in for a workout and I know I'm going to squat, and this is generalization and it changes constantly, but in general. Biceps with Matt winning everybody. Yep. I do, if we talk upper body, let's talk upper body first. I do 100 lat pull downs, 100 to 150 tricep push downs, and usually about 100 um, rear delt rows. I'm already not listening. Sounds like way too much work. <laughs> yeah. So Are you guys out as well? Like, point is, is three, I don't want to do hard work. <laughs> 300 reps of shit for my posterior before I even touch the bench. Okay, what that's going to do is, and, and I still do heavy shit after I bench. The point is, I've automatically reset the shoulder before it even starts. You're so now it's too. already pulled back. So what do we teach people to bench? You? Ten minutes. So, it's but the really point is, is what's the most important thing to hit in a big bench for normal beginners? I can tell you one thing: high sternum. Yeah. You teach people to keep your chest up. Mm. If you keep your chest up, your shoulders have to be back. Right. Right. And me and Eddie and and Charles dug that into people's heads the whole powerlifting seminar yeah. we did overseas because people don't think you need your, that's the one thing that all those lifts share the bench, the squat, and the deadlift, your chest has to be high to, to hit big weight. Yeah. And your back has to be tight. And, and your back told, has to be tight. I've told people, uh, you know, for years, you know, that when I was a kid, when I started powerlifting, they used to say big chest, yep. you'd walk out your squat. And before you'd kind of lift yep. your head and look at the judge, the coaches were always yelling, big chest, big, big chest. chest. And it's the same for all three lifts. You are trying to kind of mm. pop your chest up yep. or get your sternum in good position. So I've already, I've already reinforced that position before I even touch the bench. And this is at a world-class level. Mm. Okay? On the, on the lower body, I do 100 leg curls, 100 either 45-degree back extensions or reverse hypers. And then I do some type of um, abdominal work. And usually in a standing position because I believe that the abdominals, you're not going to hurt your back on the ground. So crunches, in my opinion, are worthless. But a lot of standing cable and band crunches, if you do them properly, teach you to engage your abs on your feet. Right. So I do a lot of that, which I've done that Think You Could Squat series for Lead FTS that talks about some of those exercises I still use today. And if you want to see a bloated mess Matt winning, go look on that because I was about <laughs> 315 in that shit. But point is, is like I'm always counterbalancing shit before I even do it. And then the same exercises apply after the workout. So I'm doing double the amount of posterior work that I do anterior work constantly built into my workouts. The trick is, is you got to change the posterior type exercises all the time because you get used to it. Now, some people are not going to think about that as mobility work, but it kind of is because you're you're preparing the, the nerve pathways oh, to be able well, to. You know, if you talk to a lot of the more advanced guys, Charles is a big, a big, uh, advocate of this but a tight muscle is a weak muscle so as you do 100 let's say you got tight hamstrings if i make you do four sets of 25 leg curls every other day for fucking a year your hamstrings are not going to be tight anymore yeah they're strong right so a, a weak muscle tries to dominate in the in the world to get along by using stretch reflex stretch reflex is enhanced by stiffness so usually a tight muscle is tight because it's weak yeah a lot of times you know people when you see somebody trying to make a point, whether it's YouTube or um, or Instagram or any form of social media or even a book or whatever it is, it, it's hard to it's hard to really pin that on somebody as like their their exact method because it's it's just one message that they share. Yeah, and you share thousands of them, right? And right. So it can get misconstrued. But I saw somebody the other day post something um, about mobility and. It talked about, you know, mobility and positioning and how important it was. And I was like, it talked about how it's the key factor. And I was like, it's not the key factor. I was like, motherfucker, come here to Super Training Gym. We'll load up the bar to 500 pounds and we'll have you squat and we'll see how your mobility plays out <laughs> with your fucking positioning, you yeah. little tiny bitch. Well, that, that's a lot and of that's people. That's a friend of mine, but I'm like, you know what? Just <laughs> But that's a lot of people. It's that... not going to pan out for you the way that you think. And I can... I've been squatting for 20-something years, and I can break parallel and sit in a nice position with a good, strong Let weight. me tell you, it's, it's, a, it's a marketing ploy, and I'll explain that. Yeah. Um, and it's also a way for people to figure out that they can do something without working hard. That's what I see when I see that shit. And um, the professional athletes, they love all that kind of stuff, too, because it's, it's pampering them even further. And oh, they don't fuck have yeah. to do any fucking oh, fuck heavy yeah. lifting. You know, and talking professional athletes, you know, I've trained two defensive ends that were fucking amazing. 
and just by lifting heavy and lifting fast, like my cycle, their vertical jumps went up four and a half inches in five, six weeks, Jesus. and they were already playing pro ball. Jeez. You know what's insane about that is I, I guarantee you— And they got more flexible and without with, doing flexibility. Without ever—yeah, ta- amazing. Without ever even talking to you about it beforehand, I guarantee you when you had them do certain things, they're like— like they had no idea of their lifts and certain things, and you're trying to think, well, what the fuck have you been doing? Oh you my went God. through college, you went through all these things. That's when you realize how ass backwards. About she how is. much do you bench? You're like, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe your coach's not a fan of benching because yeah, it can mess up people's shoulders. Maybe your quarterback, mm-hmm. whatever. Kind of understandable. Well, okay, well, what do you squat? I'm not sure. How about deadlift? I don't really know. How about you know just you can pick it overhead. They don't know anything, mm-hmm. and you're like, how is this? How, you've never gone heavy on anything. Yeah. How have you gone through your co- – and, you know, they're, they're great athletes. They are on another level. So if you get them training, you get them doing anything in the gym, and that's going to pan out and, and work okay. Yeah. But if you get them lifting some fucking heavy weights here and there, that's going to really make a change. And I have found that the higher the athlete in college, like the better the school they went to, the worse it is. Because here's the deal. If you go to a smaller school – that doesn't have, that doesn't get the star athletes, they have to polish the diamonds. Mm. So you find a lot of the better strength coaches, and I'm not saying this to everybody because yeah. I don't know them all, but in my opinion, the guys that are at the smaller colleges, they have to work harder because they're not the best. And that's why you find that over half of the NFL is from small schools because they have a work ethic now. If you're in the higher school and you're pampered all the time, you don't have a fucking work ethic and then the problem is, is that it's too late to get you strong. The only and they have you... to pay these huge dollars to take these guys and take them in like AP and IPI because they're they're in a fucking like they're in like a a cattle, you know, like a cattle breeding <laughs> mm, yeah. place. They're not they're not there to make you better. They're there to use your talent. Yeah. Whereas in the small schools, they have to make you more talented. So that's what I have found. And I think that's why you see that percentage range in the NFL is guys are from small schools because they have to work hard. Before we jump into some more questions, um, I, th- I think uh, a really you know interesting attribute of yourself, and I watch you do it time and time again, and uh, I think it's like the hardest thing to master in lifting. You already kind of mentioned that you don't really – it's not that you don't care. It's that you understand the idea of you're not going to be at full strength all the time. There is a principle. There is a uh, a reward to you know learning how to peak and peaking at certain times. And you're going to bench six eleven at this point, and it's possible that your strength is not always there throughout the year, and, and so on. Can I, can I, uh, interesting yeah. uh, point on that. But you know, one thing we didn't mention on it is if you want to be in this game a long time and you want to hit big numbers, you have to be careful to not have adrenal fatigue. If I walk into that gym and try to fucking manhandle everything all the time, eventually my adrenal fatigue is going to make me retire. So there's a lot of guys that's been in our shoes yeah. that retired five and ten years ago because they got adrenal fatigue. And it is real, you know, and that's the thing is, is and sleep accelerates it or de-accelerates yeah. it. All these other factors that are not really related to the gym, but in reality, you have to pick your battles. You know, once right. you get better, you have to pick your battles. And to me... It's maintaining that ability to not have that adrenal fatigue. So when I tell my body it's time to turn it on, it's there. But if I'm turning it on all the time, I'm wearing it out. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, uh, you know, I was talking with Eddie about this on the plane when we were making a jump flight from Iceland. And we talked about it. He said, you know what? You have 10 in each lift. You have 10 times that you're going to be able to push 100% in your whole career. Mm -hmm. 10. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean necessarily, you know, 500 is not a real PR if you're capable of squatting 750. Right. But you have 10 PRs, 10 real PRs after you've hit your genetic wall that you're going to be able to hit your whole career. So that's daunting if you think about it. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, when, when do you want them? I, yeah. I guess is the point. Do you want them in training yeah. or you want them in the books? So, you know, what I've seen you do is come off these big meets. Sometimes you're smashing uh, world record attempts and stuff. You come off the meet, maybe you weigh 290, 300. You get big, you, you know, you get jacked for the uh, meat. But I see a lot of people lifting kind of the reverse of what you do, yeah. where the off-season, uh, the, I guess going into a meet, I see a lot of people trying to lose weight. Yeah. A lot of people that are listening to the show can probably relate because they're always trying to go down to a lower weight class. Right. You're always lifting kind of differently. and you I get lighter in the off-season, and then I actually have to gain weight to do meets. Yeah, all the way to the point where I think – Maybe last time I saw you, maybe in Ohio, 
you might have been like 260 something or yeah. you know you were you were quite a bit i mean 30 40 pounds off of yeah so you know talk so, about that a little so bit. last year i got down to 262 and i got down to 13.2 percent body fat this year right so now that's like a goal like you're trying to not only just lose weight I'm trying to lose body fat with no muscle loss yeah and i'm slowly learning how to do that dieting wise Right now, I'm within 0.5% of the same leanness I got last year. I'm 280, 285, 286. Yeah. What are you Point doing is, differently than you used to do? Timing my carbohydrates correctly. What I've done is when I first learned to diet, I was so carbohydrate inefficient, and I was not, I wouldn't say borderline diabetic, but I just wasn't using carbs right. Mm. I was eating whenever I wanted, did whatever I want. Well, I b- abused that process too long. So the first thing Paula Quinn and Serrano did was cut my carbs down to 20 grams a day for almost three weeks. Talk about fucking death, right? My body ran on carbs. Yeah. Every mm-hmm. few hours, carbs, carbs, carbs. Well, what I wasn't learning how to use was fat. So the first time I went into my blood work and my triglycerides were high and my cholesterol mm-hmm. was high. So instead of Serrano putting me on like statins, he told me, cut your fucking carbs back. I only want you eating carbs around your workouts. Okay. So I did that. Next phase went as Charles told me to cut the carbs out almost completely for a while and let my body reset itself something you just said right there is is you went into a different phase i think that's yeah. important for people to understand everybody gets so excited about these different diets and they want to say that things are magic lane norton had a great post the other day and it, it caused a crazy stir but basically <laughs> as he lane always norton yeah, caused a stir as he always does and he basically said look intermittent fasting uh is not superior um keto ketogenic diets are not they're not superior i do a ketogenic diet it works well for me uh, but I try to share with people all the time, it's not anything magical. The reduction in calories is where a lot of the magic does happen in terms of weight right. loss. Same thing with intermittent fasting. The re- it's, the re- it's the reduction in calories. The point is with everybody qual- gets all excited with about With quality these proteins and fats, if you're taking them in and you're trying to eat the same amount you could eat with bad calories, it's impossible. Yeah. Right. So when I eat clean, my eat, calories yeah. are probably down 1,000 a day or more. But go. the key is, is my body's utilizing those calories better. So mm-hmm. I'm actually putting on muscle mass and less body fat. And that's, you're going to go into different phases as yes. you achieve new things, just like you're doing with your training. So what I found was last year was the first time I really kind of slightly figured out how to cut it down. And I didn't have, I, I actually ended up getting the flu about a day before the meet. And I knew I had lost like seven pounds in like mm-hmm. two days. I knew I was going to sick. I still tried to do the meet and went up to 832 on squats and it felt like 950. So I just cut it there. But long story short... I put my weight back up to 299, and I went down to 262, like I was telling you. My waist never went over 40. Hmm. So I started putting on, when I started eating big again, I wasn't putting on belly. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was putting on quad size, like you saw how big my legs are getting, and like right. glute size and shoulder size. I but saw I wasn't those glutes. Put, yeah, you saw them. But, <laughs> you know, I, I, put, I put the weight back on correctly, and that's where I started realizing is I have to, for me personally, it was a blood work thing. I... Serrano goes, look, if you want to be in this game longer, you're going to have to have phases at the middle of the year where you're eating more healthy and more athletic and you're not just trying to stay so goddamn big. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, well, this is the time of my life that now if I want to stay in this game, I need to have a different phase, like we're talking about, of my year. So right now I could give a fuck less if I can bench 550. I can still do 500 for reps. Maybe we'll do that later. but. The point of it is, is like, I'm not trying to hold on to that 611 right now. Right now is to clean my blood workout, get healthy, look like I lift weights and, you know, be an example that you can still be super strong and super athletic and you don't have to give up one for the other. So you went from about 20 carbs a day to pretty much no carbs a day. So he stripped them out. And then what'd you move into after that? How long did that process so, take? So that th- I did that for about 60, 80 days. And is roughly. that kind of a straight keto diet where the fat was real high? Fat's high, like protein's high. Um, now that I use carbohydrates correctly based on my blood work, um, I eat more white rice all day. Um, and I, I actually don't have timed carbs. I can eat pretty much whatever I want now every three days, Mm -hmm. but I put in about a hundred grams of carbs post-workout now, but my body utilizes it right. Right. And it's not a fucking candy bar. It's white rice Mm -hmm. or it's some kind of clean carbohydrate and it does digest differently and you know, affects Make your sure body everybody's definitely. catching all this uh, properly. Uh, something to understand is that, you know, there is nutrient timing. Um, there are there's a lot of research and evidence that shows, uh, you know, if you can eat your carbohydrates around your workouts. You know, if you're eating the carbohydrates before your workout, you're going to burn them kind of while, while you're working out. It could be extra energy yeah. to give you increased performance uh, during the actual uh 
training session itself, yeah. then also your body is more likely to kind of soak up yeah. the glycogen and things like that post-training. So yeah. that's another opportunity to eat those carbs. Then on top of that, when you make yourself leaner, if you go from like 20% body fat to 10% body fat, which is a huge, huge change yeah. in your metabolism, now the nutrient timing isn't as important and you can consume the carbs. Uh, you have to earn your maybe carbs. Maybe not whenever, but you can consume them and your body's more than likely going to utilize them because your body's more efficient at so, burning calories, period. To give like the listeners a, a really good example of what I heard Charles tell a lot of people because he's pretty good about figuring out how to get people leaner and more athletic. Really if, you're over, if you're over 25%, you don't deserve carbs at any time. If you're under 20, you're too fat. He, and he like yells at people. I've yep. heard him talk. If about you're under before. 20, and this is now, this is more what I remember and what I tell people. If you're under 20 percent, you can have carbs, but you have to time them, and they have to be sporadic within like three days apart. As far as like having a lot of carbs, when you get below 15 to 13 percent, where I'm at right now, you can have carbs back every meal, and you won't get fatter. You'll get leaner. Right. So the key is you have to earn your carbs. So if you're a really fat guy and you want to, you need your thirty percent body fat. You don't deserve carbs at any time. Once you start getting leaner, you guys hear that? You're too fat for carbs. <laughs> yeah. So that was something I really picked up that helped me with clients getting leaner. We got a couple of firemen that had really bad blood work. Mm -hmm. That's something else I want to hit on. Carbohydrate intake has a lot to do with your cholesterol and your triglycerides. <laughs> like, has a direct effect. Direct, like immediate. Immediate effect. Yeah. So yeah. the problem is, is that it cholesterol can affect your sleep too. A lot of times, people get rid of some carbohydrates, yeah. and it helps their sleep. What more. Serrano talks about a lot in his office with people, instead of getting on statins, is that you back off your carbohydrate, you back off your inflammation. Cholesterol in your bloodstream is actually an inflammatory process. So once you back off your bad carbs or carbs in general your body's going to clear out its bloodstream. So, you know, like you bruise your knee and it gets inflamed. Well, high cholesterol is an inflammation of the blood right. caused usually by too much carbohydrate intake. So once you back that out, if you have cholesterol problems, do not let your doctor put you on statins. Watch your fucking carbs and watch the cholesterol clear itself up without drugs. I have, uh, you know, something weird. I don't even know what's going on my elbow, fucking bone chip, or I don't even know what it is. But I have bursitis in my elbow, and my elbow will swell up. And it will get pretty. Well, you can swollen. see how it sticks. See, look how much more yours sticks out than mine. Yeah, yeah, it sticks. Yeah, it sticks out quite a bit. Yeah. But being on a ketogenic diet for so like this thing was was substantially swollen to Hold where up. you would be like, oh, what's wrong? Like you would you would notice it when you see me. And now, even after you know, I benched this morning, um, it'll flare up, but not nearly as much. So the inflammation has definitely uh, cleared yeah. up quite a bit just from not yeah. eating carbs. So if you have joint pain or you have cholesterol issues or triglyceride issues. Be mindful of your carbohydrate intake, and it will help your body recover itself, in my opinion. Well, there's a question came in here that I don't know the answer to, so I'm going to ask it. Um, ask him about evacuation training and how he incorporate, cor incorporates it into his pre-meat cycle. Who, who said? Who? Steven Lenegar. Oh, my God. So, yeah, we used to have this thing where we would measure ourselves pre- and post-shit. <laughs> and Steven Lenegar used to work with me at Capital Club. That's the place... Uh, I used to work at downtown. That's but, great. Uh, Pre and post poop? Yeah. So the most I've ever lost before is like six and a half pounds. <laughs> but that was after major, like, major eating. That's huge. Uh, a lot of these things are, are things that we definitely have already yeah, covered. things are a little bit uh, uh, re repetitive. Um, Jessica, can you pop up here for a second? She's got a couple of questions in the tank, I think. We're going to have her ask them. Come on this side of me here. What's up, dog? Okay. Um, I can't pronounce this person's name, but they say, what are your thoughts on squatting and deadlifting in the same day? Um, if you're a power lifter, this is going to uh, – it would be a better question to ask who. If you're a power lifter, you have to get used to it because the squat does affect the deadlift, and until you build up a – tolerance to being able to pull heavy after squatting heavy you can't do that on separate days in my opinion if you're talking firefighters or military you want to separate them because you need to watch how much compression you're doing every day because you got running you have all these impactive things so the point is is like what i do is i select one compressive movement per workout and then everything else i try to do traction based like reverse hypers 45 degree back extensions because you have to balance out the impact or the, the spinal loading, and you have to reverse it, or you're going to have a short career as a tactical athlete. So if I'm trying to lower injury rates in an apartment, it has a very different view than if I'm trying to be a powerlifter. I've heard you talk before about compression, and I haven't heard a ton of other people talk about it. 
uh, before. Um, and you kind of mentioned to me, I think we might have been texting back and forth a while ago, uh, but basically said something to the effect of, you know, somebody has a back issue or some of the military, some, just whoever you're working with, um, even a power lifter, just yeah. like we all get in the habit of overlifting, you know, yeah. overtraining. Um, it's powerlifting, so we're going to lift heavy every chance we get. It's just yep. the way it goes. Squat, bench, deadlift, uh, time and time again, they all tax the back. They all tax the lower back. How are you finding some ways to uh, get rid of some of that compression? Well, so like I said, with those warm-ups we talked about is I'm, I'm doing everything non-compressive. So 45-degree back extensions, reverse hypers, sled dragging like what you're using now. I try to do everything I can that's, that's traction-based. And that's what's helped with the belt squat so much is that now I can do tons of volume on squatting. I don't have the I don't have the vertebral spinal compression, so I do upwards of a hundred reps of belt squats before I even touch mm -hmm. a bar, and I and I actually teach all of my firemen have to belt so squat. You, you'll, so you'll hit your belt squat up pretty hard before you get on your. Actual... I, I, when I did that eight sixty five squat, I was doing ten thousand pounds of belt squat work before I touched a bar. What does that look like set rep wise? <laughs> Like four sets of twenty five with like fucking two fifty to okay. four hundred, like no shit. So that's I mean, and if you watch my videos on Instagram, you'll see you'll see some of the sets. But the point is, is that um, that's why my legs are so fucking huge and athletic is because I do tons of fucking volume like that. But I also um, that's almost like a bodybuilding method in some weird way because you're pre fatiguing the muscle. Uh, Donnie Thompson actually did similar things when he was training. Yeah. I don't know if you remember, but he would do dynamic effort mm -hmm. squats and in between, and he would do no belt, no gear, even though he was a geared power lifter. In between, he would do kettlebell swings. Yeah. And yeah. then we were like, my, his work capacity was fucking insane. Yeah, he, he, played, he played pro football. Yeah. Here, nuts. Here's my thought process for this system, and it had nothing to do with that directly at first. Right. My point is, is I always wanted to know how strong I was fatigued because I knew walking into a meet, I couldn't always gauge myself on being 100% all the time. So mm -hmm. if you're like, oh, I had what to be if I was tired. 5 what if, what if I'm fucked up and I don't feel good? Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm used to doing 100 fucking belt squats before I even touch a bar, and then I take that away only for like two weeks before I meet, holy shit. It was like everything I touched was like light as hell. Mm -hmm. And the reason was I was used to being in a pre-fatigue state constantly. So going to a meet was like literally a quarter of the work, even though I was straining my balls off. Mm -hmm. So I put myself at deficits in training to where I don't have to be 100% to whip everybody's ass. Make sense? Jessica, yeah. you want to ask him why his traps are pushing his head off his body? Is that, is that, is that I don't question? need a pillow when I lay on my side. <laughs> yeah, uh, Super Male Vitality 2 Rep says, uh, best tips for training for special ops selection. I actually answered that question. Oh, well. It's all right. God. Like I said, the key is to walk in as 100% healthy on that. You have to be 100% healthy because they're just going to test your toughness again. Yeah. So you have to just make sure you walk in healthy. But I would say if you're going for special ops selection, the training process started two years ago. Yeah. Because you have to build up a work capacity to where a normal person's workout, if you come in and like – so, for instance, if I get a new power for coming into my gym – and let's say he's been lifting on his own and he hasn't seen me. He doesn't know anything I do. My warm-up will fucking kill him. And then I go lift. But the point is, is how did I build up that kind of capacity long periods of time? Make sense? So the key is, is if, you, if you're – and I get this question all the time. Hey, I got two weeks before I go to special ops or I got two weeks. What do I change? Nothing to change now. You're fucked. Mm -hmm. If you're not ready, you're fucked by then. Mm -hmm. All right. I got another question. <laughs> How do you implement conjugate with raw lifters? Is there additional volume work after hitting the top one rep max? Well, okay, so in the raw lifting, there is no one rep max in training unless it's something insane. It's never free weight. The trick is that I have found works for me is that I take a free weight and develop it like linear periodization. So let's say 10 weeks out. So week 10, I'll do 75% for five. Let's say it's 600. I do 600 for five. Two weeks in between that, weird shit, safety bar, bands, chains, fucking boxes, whatever. Then the week seven, I'll do 80% for four. So now I'm doing like 700 for four. So yeah, it's about right. So then I'll do that. And then two weeks in between that, all kinds of weird shit. And then three or four weeks out, I'll do 750, 765 for a triple. And then the week before the meet... I'll do 820. I did 825 for two before I squatted 865. I actually did 835 this last training cycle 
um, before I got sick because I was ready to hit the 903. But the point is, is like I linear periodize the raw weight so I get the feel. And then everything else in between, I just smash my fucking body to pieces, but I don't do any singles. So to get ready to squat 900, I did 835 for two. All right. The, so, uh, does that make, does on, that the, on the in-between weeks where you're doing the safety bar and the chains and so on, are those singles? Those are not singles. Those are at least – so my difference in training is when we were at Westside, we did a lot of singles to get our central nervous system ready for weights. I don't need that anymore. I need muscle work. So for raw lifting, your muscle's doing a lot of the work. You need to just keep your training at threes and twos at the minimal. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Make sense? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, back on that same point again, it, it's actually – it was actually pretty impossible to do multiple reps uh, in gear. Oh, yeah. You know, in a bench shirt, it was just awkward. Yep. The shirt would move a little bit, and it just, to get into that second rep was really hard. I guess to help um, with the with the, the gear yeah. stuff, what we didn't do is increase the reps. We increased the time under tension. So what I learned from George Halbert was you don't want to do threes in a shirt, but what you can do is lower it in six to eight seconds. Now mm -hmm. you got the endurance, where right. if you lower it in your own time, teaches you not only perfect form under blistering weights, but it gets more work. So you almost slow it down yeah. like a bodybuilder in the equipment to dial in the form and feel the weight and have it in your hands longer. So Makes I think, sense. you know, like every training system um, has to be like ever evolving. You know, if you, if you stay in one spot, then the system is going to have holes in it and you have to have the ability to adjust and the ability to move in and out of different yes. phases. So what I one of the things with like the West side method, when it, when it comes to, when you look at the model that was built for geared lifting, and if you try to apply that directly over to raw power lifting, in my opinion, it could be a mistake because of, of that very question that you answered really well just now is that if you're doing like max effort work and you're going for a heavy single, and your best deadlift is 365. The warm up to that and the 315 that you hit before the 365, and maybe you took a tweener between 365 and 315, 315, 350, or 345, and 365 is not enough work, even if you include uh, some uh, a lot of assistance work, yep. it's not enough work to really make you better, especially right. over a long period of time. And so that's something that's really important. You're going to need to figure out you either need more reps or you need more sets. You need more of something in order to make that a better <clears throat> You're hitting scenario. it right on the head. It's what do you need at that time. That's what makes conjugate so powerful in the right hands and so fucked up in the worst hands because it's not based on a system or scenario. It's based on solely on what you need at that time. Mm -hmm. So right now, I now, know to squat 903. Same, you took the same situation and somebody deadlifted 765. Now, maybe they did get enough work in, and maybe they took their time with their warm-up, and they got some good work in, and then maybe they did a back offset and so on. Yeah. Now you're talking about something. Now you have a body of work yep. that you can take from one week to the next and actually get stronger Yeah, exactly. With. So if you need more reps, then you have to dial your stuff accordingly. If you need more intensity, you have to dial stuff accordingly. The, the, the importance with the conjugate system is it's not a piece of paper laid down that gives you all the, all the things in front of you. That, and, it's, and it's a concrete system that I use and Louie uses. We have modified the system to fit our direct needs at that time. Mm. And the most powerful person in this field is a person that can manipulate all variables to get what they want of the result. And remembering that you never step in the same pond twice. So what worked for me last year is not going to work for me this year. I might have to modify two, three, four, five percent, maybe ten percent of what I do based on what I know I've seen in my performance. And so, how does that not apply to everything else that you do in your life? It does everything. It applies to fucking everything. Yeah, but <laughs> across the board. But but the tendency is to want to to yeah, replicate yeah. exactly <laughs> what you did before. Mm -hmm. well, that's what everybody. That's does. the problem with yeah. the army right now. They're trying to replicate what they what performance standard they had in the '60s and do it in 2017. It's not the same person. Yeah. They're not the same people. There's different food. I mean, there's yeah, all kinds of different things. Yeah, everything's different. Here. There's all kinds of different shit going on. We, we've went a, a pretty good amount of time here yes. with uh, Mr. We, we have. Mr. Yeah. Matt winning. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about your belt squat a little bit more because okay. I think that that's interesting. You, you mentioned earlier in the podcast about how it just got to a certain point when you started – you know, traveling to these different gyms and training with different people. Then you're thinking about these different bars and different bands and chains and these all these different things. Yeah. Then you're thinking, shit, I just need to get all that shit for myself. So now yep. you have your own gym. Yeah. 
And beyond that, you start working with different pieces of equipment. And you're like, man, this would probably be better if it did this. Because you have specialized weird shit in your gym. I've been to your gym before, and it's, mm-hmm. it's pretty awesome. you got specialized bars. Well, that's the you advantage. Specialized you're kind of like how Duffin has squat. being a kind of an engineer. Is, you know, I, was an, I was a welder, and my whole family did welding-type shit mm. when I was a kid. So initially, what I did before I went to school was I signed up to be in the pipe fitters union. Because I loved working on steel. I love that pipe. I love the pipe. <laughs> you know, the black pipe. That's right. So um, the point is, is I was really interested in welding because it was kind of in the family. So I knew enough to, like, fabricate some things myself. Well, I started realizing the belt squat came into fruition one day. Um, actually, uh, Bill Crawford was the first one I saw make. He actually uh, gave it to me at my gym. Mm. And he wasn't a big squatter. Yeah. And he had had it built to the point that... Um, he, he said it was strong enough to hold a certain amount of weight. I can't remember what that was. I ended up breaking the motherfucker in half <laughs> because I'm not a bencher. I'm a squatter. Yeah. And I was squatting huge weights back then. So I took it back home and I started welding on it and fixing it. And I started realizing that when I figured out these cu- couple of angles that I was working with is that I was getting really close to a one-to-one ratio of real squats. My initial point of having a belt squat at the gym was as a three lift, three lift guy, is that sometimes the straight bar fucking rocked my shoulders. Mm-hmm. And then two days later, I was having trouble benching. So I was like, man, I really need something that I can take the pressure off of my my shoulders, but I also need to know where I'm at all the time because I don't want to I don't want to have a machine that I can't tell how strong I am, mm-hmm. which negated the, the pit shark machine. Because as you know, I mean, the last time I worked out on a pit shark, I did 1,000 for 10 reps. <laughs> well, I can't fucking do that on squats. Yeah. I'm a strong motherfucker, but that's crazy. So the point is, is like I realized that the the, the uh, leverage and the mm-hmm. mechanics of the machine was off. So I started playing around. Figured, it takes a lot of time to work out on something, too, where you need to load it up with that much weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. So just by default playing and welding and cutting for two years, I got it to where it was almost dialed in perfect nuts. And it was dialing perfect nuts with a lot of people. So, like, I was squatting 800 for three on it. I did 865. My training partner squatted 700. He did 620 for three. So, I'm thinking, man, that, that match is pretty close to what. And then, my couple of the girls I have in the gym that squat around 300, they do like 250 for three. And I'm like, man, this is like perfect, right? Yeah. So, I started playing with it then. And then I'd break it again because I was too strong. And then I'd make it stronger <laughs> there. The point is, I should have put it in a CAD machine. Yeah. And then had to measure had to the pressure points. Right. But I figured it out as I went along, but I broke my legs three or four times. <laughs> so once I got it all dialed in and figured out, I started using it. And what I started realizing was when I'd get new clients or firemen, I'd have them train on this bell squat machine, and it would teach their form impeccably to sit back. Right. So they're learning the squat from the hip. And the machine, the way it angles, teaches you to st- reach your ass back and push your knees out. Because right. if you do it like a normal bend, it doesn't feel right. Mm. And, and, only- and it, pull, it pulls you down towards the ground, which is different than having the weight kind of smushy exactly down, like, on so that's squat. why flex wheeler's using it right now because he's got back fusions yeah, I saw some mm-hmm. that video. and he's got to get his legs big for the olympia he's trying to make a comeback yeah, at 51 that's awesome so he can only use my bell squat really and some leg pressing stuff because his back can't take regular squats mm-hmm. anymore and then so what i did was i started designing it and then we started fabricating it and then it started catching on because a lot of the firemen were using it and now their squat forms are fucking perfect. Nice. Well, then the back injury started going down because now when they bend down to pick something up, they sit their ass back and they pick their chest up. Mm. Sounds right. crazy, right? Well, and you probably have some people that, that come to you that are, you know, older or whatever and maybe they just, I don't know, maybe they got shoulder issues. Maybe they just struggle like using a well, regular bar and doing a regular squat. Yeah, so I mean, let's not this get gives it, you another option, right? Yeah, let's not get it twisted. I mean, I, here's the thing. When somebody matter, walks into right? my gym or I walk into a fire department and they already have the stuff I want, they have to squat on that machine for eight weeks before I teach them a bar. Mm. You know what I've learned was? I've taken away all my headache. Right. The form's perfect. They know how to sit back. They know how to load the posterior chain. So now what I started realizing was this is an excellent teaching tool, not only yeah. – for people that are beginners, but now people I have to rehab around injuries. If you come to me and all I got is a CrossFit gym with straight bars and you have a back problem, what the fuck are we going to do? Mm. Right. Yeah. Jack shit. So I have to be able to mold my facility and people I work with around town and in the military around all these 
pressure points. There's and a lot like of people issues. that just they don't fucking care about working out that much anyway. No, they don't want to come to your gym. They want to get a good workout. So, they want to get some results, and maybe they don't they don't care about doing a yeah. box squat with no, they don't. Pounds. No, they don't care. So the next the next evolution of it was. One day I'm working out in there by myself. My training partners are on vacation or some shit. And I want to use the belt squat because I don't have any spotters. Right. So I load the fucker up to like 700 and I'm doing like a set of five or eight. I get to the bottom and I barely get out of the bottom because I'm like fucking pushing, right? And I'm thinking, man, it'd be really nice if I had a built-in spotter that I could just get underneath there and change a pin. And I could put this thing about a half an inch deeper than where I normally squat depth-wise, and if I get in trouble, to set the fucker down. Mm. Well, none of the other machines had anything like that. Mm -hmm. So if you're pinned in it, you're pinned, and there's no way to get out. So I'm like, man, I need to build this thing in, especially if a high school wants it or a college, mm -hmm. right. where I can set it in there, put the pin where I want it, and I turn my back, and if something happens, they just yeah. set it down. So that's where I it got evolved. caught in a pit shark a couple days ago. Yeah, so the, like the pit shark's got a problem with that, and the other, the, the belt-driven one like Louie has, yeah. has got a problem with that. That pit, mine... When you set it to where you want it, you can bail out of it at any and time, and that's where and it can Smart. run by itself. It has the lever built in where you can rack it by yourself. Yeah. You don't have to reach way out. It's just it's just natural. But I the reason it works, yeah. But the reason it works is because a fucking real lifter actually built it right. and thought about all that and got in trouble and then refixed it. <laughs> six who's years. A, who's the real lifter? I thought you said you worked oh, on. Oh yeah, that. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. This other guy, I know. <laughs> So, That's awesome. You got anything else you've been working on? Uh, I got a special like a bar special camber bar that I'm working cool. on. You can't pinch into. Um, we're making um, some fat bars for pull downs that are non knurled so you got to have a grip from hell. Ooh, but terrible. what I realized was is that I don't have time in my workouts to develop my hands. I just you know I work with a lot of clients. I'm around. Yeah. So me doing extra grip work at the end or beginning of workouts is ridiculous. I've never had a hand problem. Right. But what I started realizing was I never had a hand problem because almost all my accessory work is done with fat handles and fat handles with no knurling. Yeah. So I have to squeeze it and that bar can slip. So what I'm starting to realize is there's no market. Nobody has anything like that on the market. So mm -hmm. I'm starting to make these fat handles, to, like the upside down V bar pull downs mm -hmm. and like stuff for like tricep push downs. Just a thicker grip, period. Mm -hmm. Thicker yeah. grip. So we do like three inch handle stuff. So if you can do pull downs with three inch handles with like 180 pounds for like sets of ten, yeah. you don't have a fucking grip problem. There you go. Right. So I know uh, Poliquin's really big on different grips and stuff yeah. like that too. Yeah, I mean your hands. Once your hands tell your brain that you've had enough, you've had enough. I don't care how strong your legs are. So lifting in straps and lifting with grip assistance actually is a short term way to not see long term results. Get over here, Smokey. Just quit being shy over there. <laughs> Steven over here, a.k.a. Smokey, is a huge fan of yours. I'm sure that he's got at least at least two or three questions for you, or at yeah. least one. I'll uh, this down quite a bit with this guy. Your beard's so long, I don't know if I answer questions to ISIS, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see you doing a lot of stuff on the floor, whether that's uh, tricep extensions, rolling dumbbell, dumbbell extensions. Why do you tend to move to the floor versus a bench? A lot of it's just variability. I'm so good at doing the bench. Um, that I don't need the bench to get better. So I try to find things that make things more awkward. For some reason, where I stop on the floor is a very awkward position for me because it's a couple inches higher than where I would like to start. So people think, well, that's got to be easier because it's shorter range of motion. Well, anybody that knows, floor pressing is way fucking harder than a normal bench. So what I find is, is that I have a small gym. I don't have a lot of variability in benches. I have the basics. So I have to use everything at my disposal. So the floor is another variability that I like to use because it's quick and fast and I don't need extra equipment for. So that's why I like the floor, but it also just develops that weird spot. So I'm always looking for exercises that make it harder, not that make me feel like stronger. That's why I don't agree with like these safety bars with the really long handles on them because it's just increasing your leverage. A safety bar is built to rip your fucking head off. So if you're prying on the bar, you're not doing what that bar was intended to do. That's why if you notice my safety bar, it has chains welded on it. So you got these handlebar grips, and when you go to lift on it, you're lifting on a chain that doesn't push up anything. <laughs> it's like a dummy dummy switch, you know? So. Uh, uh, the, lastly, uh, sandals. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I well, guess, I should be sponsored guess, by Jordan by uh, now. Slides. Uh, I see you wearing slides quite a bit. Is there a, is there a reason to it? Uh, yeah, especially when you bench. <laughs> Well, it looks okay. Amazing. Let me do. Let me do the the my thought pattern behind it. One is when I put shoes on the bench, I feel like I get more leg drive, which I probably do because the sandals are slippery. So what it does is it isolates more of my leg drive. Actually, takes it away a little bit. So when I put my Olympic shoes on or whatever shoes I decide to bench in, it feels like a more sound in my footing. 
But the real reason I do it is because I'm a fucking lazy. <laughs> and after I, you know, I'm not that unflexible to not get my shoes on. As you can see today, I have shoes on because yeah. I'm riding my Harley. But I, I still ride my Harley in sandals. But the point is, is that um, a lot of times my body is very locked up after heavy deadlifts and squat sessions. And it is murder to put my fucking shoes on. But it's been that way since I was a kid. And a lot of that I attribute towards getting hit by the car and being in a full-legged cast for a year. Um, really stiffened up certain parts of my ankle, um, where I don't have a lot of ankle um, mobility. And that makes it very difficult to put, like, different types of shoes and things like that on. So I only put shoes on when I have to, but I'm just fucking lazy and, like, just putting on slides and walking out the door. Yeah. So that's really why I wear them. But, yeah, I get, I'm getting more famous for wearing slides than almost anything. But, <laughs> yeah, I uh, see them quite a bit. Well, yeah. I, yeah, I just appreciate everything. I always get fired up. I follow you on IG, and then Mark will say, what the hell are you doing today? I'm like, oh, Matt was doing this, so I'm doing this today. I, so. I wish, you know, in, in certain spots, I wish that half the stuff I did with Chuck at Lexington and Westside was filmed back 10, 15 years ago because there was some shit we did in there that makes stuff that I do on Instagram now look retarded. You know, it's just retarded. We just didn't know. You know, train harder, get stronger, get broke, get the fuck out of there, right? I mean, that's the way it was. So I, I wish some of that stuff was on, was on film just to kind of inspire other people. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's awesome that so many people are interested in what I do. You know, <laughs> embarrassing me. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing some of those videos when Chuck was getting ready for some meets and you were getting ready for some stuff, and it was fucking. Yeah, I saw. Insanity. I mean, quickly, I saw. I saw Chuck of Ogapool squat eight fifty five bar weight. Two blues and a green. So 1350, 1400 band tension and do it for a double. And Vlad, that had the world record squat at 1250 and dunked that motherfucker, he got stapled under that shit three times. He tried it three times, couldn't stand up with it, and Chuck could. And that was something. That's so scary when people keep trying stuff and they keep Dude. missing it. And you're like, don't this try well, it. Well, 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 what was funny was, is we, you know, we <laughs> Stop had. Stop trying. We were good spotters, but, you know, Vlad blew his fucking knees off in the gym at Westside not more than a couple months after we left because nobody told him to back off, you know. And you know how Louis is. If you're going to push 100 miles an hour, he's going to watch you. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's not going to say, no, nah, I don't know about doing all that, you know. He's going to encourage you, yeah. So. Uh, you said you got run over by a car. I know you mentioned it before on other podcasts, but just. Quick, uh, what happened? You got hit by a car? Um, so yeah. I was I was kindergarten going into first grade. Uh, two weeks before school started, we were playing a normal game of like tag on our bicycles in the uh, in the neighborhood, and it was a kid named um, Gus was just down the street, and we were playing. And the the game was if you tap the other person with your tire or touch them, they're it, and they got to chase you. You're 10, 12, six. Six. Oh, oh, six, six. So I'm out, you know, so obviously I don't know any better than to jump out in the fucking street, <laughs> which is partially my fault. Uh, the other part of that fault was this lady was driving 50 miles an hour in a 20 mile an hour mm. zone. And I went out in front of her and Gus missed his tire. Her car missed his tire by that much and got me completely. Mm. So it hit my right leg and broke it, shattered my right leg in seven places four of which were below the knee they almost amputated it and then they broke my pelvis and then my other leg was fractured in four places it was some of the worst lower body damage that anybody's ever seen that weren't amputated and they had to do three surgeries one of which was experimental because they didn't they they thought mm. if this surgery doesn't stick they're going to cut my leg off below the knee like right above the Crazy. right below the knee so um, I don't remember getting hit. I remember waking up in the ambulance and my legs are fucking screaming and I got this bright light in my face and all these, I could hear people just going crazy and then they just put me right back out. Well, I wake up in the emergency room and my mom's there cause she's in charge of surgery. So not only is my mom at work and hears about it, she knows her son's coming in on the ambulance fucking yeah. destroyed. And my mom helped the doctors with the surgery. Wow. So you can imagine working on your own kid. I mean, <laughs> fucking gnarly, right? Yeah. So... Um, so the, after the third surgery and they got everything's fixed, a guy named Dr. Matchett was, was pretty, pretty big pioneer in Indiana on surgical, uh, you know, orthopedic, uh, lower, lower limb breaks. He tried a special surgery where they drilled two holes in my leg and then they put, uh, titanium pins in, and then they actually had to build the cast around and the an titanium. They injected it. Yeah. In so it. basically I turned into <laughs> fucking Wolverine. Um, so they put, they put two pins in long ways, like, uh, this way. Uh huh. So uh, perpendicular to actually hold the bones in place because when my bones broke below my leg, they splintered like a tree getting hit by lightning. They didn't cut in half. Mm -hmm. They got split long ways. And 
two of those breaks were right next to my ankle. So they had to build this special uh, titanium system around the outside of my leg to hold it all together while it tried to mend itself. And they said they're going to give it six weeks to mend, and if it doesn't start mending, they're going to have to cut it off. And I didn't know this until I got older. So um, I was in a full wheelchair for a year. Um, they actually dr- – I wish I could find pictures of me in the wheelchair, but what's funny is – my mom and my mom and all of them never thought to take pictures while I was messed up. I still have my casts, hmm. and they're up on my wall just as a reminder. If you come in and bitch about like your elbow, you bitch about your knee to me, <laughs> I will fucking punch you in the dick, <laughs> right? So yeah, motherfucker, yeah. your knee hurts, right? <laughs> so that that's kind of what happened and always set me back. So the first sport that I ever got into was swimming because I was a buoyant. It didn't. It didn't hurt. Mm-hmm. Non impact. That's how my lats and shit started to grow. So I was pretty fast, but by the time I was twelve or thirteen, I was too big. Mm-hmm. I was starting to become what I am now. Which you know, at thirteen years old, I walk into the gym and Tim, the guy I was telling you this big bencher, saw me, and he's like, "This." I was one hundred and sixty-eight pounds at twelve and a half years old. So sure. I was a big fucking yeah, you're kid. Big, yeah. So um, it took a long time. So everything that I've earned on deadlifts and squats have been completely balls. Like balls, consistency, um, determination. Is that why, when you deadlift? Is that why your knee, like when you deadlift, push out? Your, yeah, your knees push out a lot. Yeah, is I it think it's injury? just because. Well, I don't know if what, it's because of the injury or whatever. It's not bow legged. I think my hips feel the strongest because we were always taught to push out squatting in the mm. old day. You know, so I don't have that forward knee travel. Right. My body knows when it strains, push your knees out. Right. So that's why it does that. Um, which can put me in a bad position sometimes. Yeah, on a deadlift, yeah. But it's, it's how I have such an impressive squat. So I kind of have unintentionally done that to, right. I think a lot of it's just motor pattern. And I've been working on it. Sumo deadlift doesn't feel good? Sumo deadlift feels actually better, but yeah. I just don't have the, I have the hip mobility on a back squat, but I don't have the hip mobility. I think it's because of my arm length. I'm naturally built the bench. Mm. Right. So it takes a long, it's a long time to get me down to that bar it's a long distance yeah so it constantly like me and you it puts us in a rolled over position no matter what position i'm in yeah which makes my lower back really have to work hard um but what i've noticed the long the long term issue with the car accident was it left me with a right leg that's nine millimeters shorter than the left now i didn't find that out until i had a very expensive bone density scan by a computer not by a person measuring Mm -hmm. it with a tape like they put you in an MRI machine and they measure the bone like mm. with a computer. And what I found was it was tilting my pelvis to the my mm. my left my left side gotcha. of my pelvis was up, my right was down. I was getting all kinds of back pain when I was doing those USAPL meets. And my mom was like, "Well, you're just getting too fucking strong." You know, she didn't know, and she was right too. You know, I was a strong motherfucker. Yeah. But what I found was is that I needed a nine millimeter lift in my shoe. Once I found once I did that, my back pain went away. But what I've noticed is even though I fixed the imperfection in my mm-hmm. spine. Um, it still can limit the amount of pressure compressive wise that I can put on my lumbar, which has made me train very smart and kept other things on my body very healthy. Right. So my biggest problem with my deadlift is also my savior because it doesn't allow me to deadlift near as much as I should, probably would have. Mm-hmm. So me pulling my, my greatest achievement of all the things I've done was pulling 804 one, because I'm not built for it, and two, because of all the injuries and issues that I've had made me have to work for that motherfucker and do it very smart. Well, and number three, because Ed Cone can die now. Yeah, and he can die. <laughs> he can die <laughs> in peace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kind of, uh, let's just go with a parting shot here yeah. to, uh, you know, you see a lot of stuff happening on social media and a lot of people, you know, selling different programs and stuff, and um, I'm of the opinion of some of the things that you share, but I just see people doing way too much. You know, way too much deadlift and way too much squatting, squatting, you know, four or five times a week, deadlifting three times. You know, I just see a, a lot of these things. And and it's all positive because it's getting people moving, and it's great that there's coaches that are available. Uh, and it's great that more people in the fitness industry are making more money because they have online coaching. I'm supportive of all of it. Yep. However, I just see people lifting too heavy too often and just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on it. I, I'm totally in agreement, And I think, you know, like I said, not, not to name – or chastise anyone in particular, but the guys like Norton and those dudes glorify that shit doing high volume, you know, but the problem is like, it's a badge of courage. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that's like the thing is it's, it's fucked cooler. a lot of people up and a lot of people that's condoned that shit are not around anymore. And that's where I have to think you have to, what I always say, and we always talk about this. If you want to listen to what somebody has to say, I want them around for 20 fucking years with minimal injuries. 
and decent numbers. I don't right. I don't care if they break world records, mm-hmm. but if they have really good numbers compared to whatever you want to compare it to, and they're around a long time, I want to listen to what you have to say. Right. If you're a shooting star and you do, you know, 700 pounds for 10 reps and then you're hurt the next year, I don't hold anything in value of what you say. And the problem is is that now these people, because they see something on YouTube or Instagram, call themselves a so-called expert. This is why I hold Fred Hatfield, in my opinion, in a higher range of thought pattern, and this is going to piss a lot of people off, than Louie. <laughs> And why? Because Fred Hatfield not only wanted to talk it, he went and got his PhD. Yeah. My point is, if you want to be a physics professor and talk about force, mass, and acceleration, you want to tell people biomechanics, and you want to tell people nutrition, go get a fucking doctorate in that shit. You should understand it. Right? Because it gives you a broader spectrum. I'm not saying that... Well, you went to one of the best universities for it, too, Yeah, I mean, Kramer and Volick and all them were at Ball State when I was there. So, that yeah, I mean, that tree is huge. If you talk to a lot of people that are in college and teach now... They have been influenced by somebody in that tree. A lot of people don't know this, but you know Brian Brian Shaw. He was a, a strength coach before he, you know, started yeah. winning world's strongest man yeah. titles left and so right. So my point is, is like I tried to push my own limits physically and tell people that I was the real deal by pushing my own limits. But I also went to school and and put the work in there to make sure that I had some credibility behind me and not just be this guy that's just strong. You know, I think that's what's really separated me and made me sit back and maybe dive into other areas that not only I see needed help but needed explanation and that's where I think that you know I mean kind of talking about Fred Hatfield is he was a pioneer because of that not because he squatted 1014 not because he was a great lifter in his time because he was all of that plus a PhD which means he right. wanted to talk it and walk it mm-hmm. so that's that's kind of where I he try to stand on the entire that. certification program, yeah the ISSA yeah yeah yeah, yeah. crazy um, yeah, I think, you know, just it goes along with your with everything you've been doing over the years. It goes along with your longevity is the fact that you've not only been lifting, but you also have been doing something which is very simple to do. You've been thinking yeah. the entire time. Yeah. You know, and a, a good a good reference point for people when they have ideas or they, they start getting excited about something. If you start thinking about something all the time then that that is something that's really positive for you to like lean towards Mm -hmm. even if it's like a a relationship a a concept an idea an invention uh, fitness fucking nutrition yeah if you start to do something and then all of a sudden you start to fucking it starts to consume your Mm -hmm. your soul then that is something you're going to want to really lean on that's something it's a passion it's something to really pay attention to. You know, I know, like, for years, I don't do it so much anymore because it's like I might blow something out. But, <laughs> uh, you know, whether it was uh, sitting at a chair or sitting at a desk or getting up off my couch or getting up off the toilet, it didn't matter what <laughs> form of getting up it was. It's like I would push my knees out and I would, like, squat yeah. up like I was, like, doing Reinforce a fucking proper motor patterns. box squat. I'd go around the house and every once in a while I'd just be, like, doing, like, an air bench. I'm like, oh, yeah, elbows <laughs> drive them down and in a little bit bit and yeah. keep the chest up and and even to the point when uh when i'm sleeping i fucking wake up and i'm like my arms go flying because i'm thinking about benching or doing oh. something in my some sort of lift in my sleep so <laughs> if you're like matt winning and you're leaning towards something and something starts to consume you like that the way it has with him then fucking go all in and, and go for it and that comes back to the, what we started at the beginning is you know if people are afraid to direct their passion and go for what they want and mm-hmm. that's that's the trick with getting strong, being successful. And that's why I say that not all of us are where we're at today by coincidence. We all worked right. our asses off to get there and found a passion and just drove for it and let everything else get out of the way. And it's also not something you just randomly dive into uh, 1,000%. It takes time. Yes. You know, you didn't you didn't start out with your own gym. You, yep. know, you had to kind of earn it, right? You had to earn it over, over a period of time. You had to earn your knowledge over the years. That earn your strength. You had... Uh, you know, all those years of college, you had all the years to, to learn about strength and conditioning, exercise science, exercise physiology, all of that. But then even after that, it wasn't enough. You nope. had to go and learn from Louis Simmons. You had to go and learn from this guy and that guy and research. And you're still reading and still learning today. Yep, and that's how you got to do it. It's always a constant learning process. And at the end of the, the journey, wherever that is, 50 years old, 60 years old, death, whatever, the trick is is that you're constantly learning because anybody that tells you they know what the fuck's going on is completely <laughs> wrong. Because every time, I, you know, if I'm changing what I think at 10% every year in 10 years, it's not the same thought pattern at all. You know, yeah. so change 100%. Yep. 
good quick math. Uh, where can people find you? Um, I'm on Real Matt Winning at um, Instagram, and then I have winningstrength.com, uh, the website for um, ordering. Is that where people like, can buy your belt squat? Yeah, the belt squats there, and then the online training stuff. Because what I'll do with the online training is actually you have to turn in videos, goals, equipment. I base everything off a of custom periodization pro- progress, and then your workouts are based on what I see in the videos that you need at that time, which I think is missing a lot in these programs. People buy a 531 book or whatever. There is not, the system is not that simple. The system is what you need at that time and what your form's showing, not just a book or whatever. So that's where all those things are. Um, And then my gym's in Columbus, Ohio. We do a lot of private, private seminars and group seminars. And then I travel if it's worth my time, but it's getting hard to leave now since I have, you know, five fire departments. Yeah. I always say there's a big difference between like online training and online coaching. Yeah. Um, Online training would be that somebody just gives you a workout and then you just go and do it, which again, I'm not going to knock that. That's, that's one way of doing things. And that's, uh, gets people to work out and maybe it gets somebody exposes somebody new to working out and they don't want to think about it and so on. There's a lot of good things. But online coaching, it sounds like that's what you're passionate yeah. about. Where so you're we check we check on their coaching somebody yeah. through the entire. I process. make them. I watch their speed work and watch their max lifts every week and give them feedback if necessary. But what you find is, is if somebody has a weakness, the minimum amount of time to make it a little bit better is 12 weeks. I mean, everything's a long term process. Yeah. You can't go, oh, I have weak hamstrings and I'm going to get a program from Matt and it's going to be fixed in 12 weeks. It's not the case. So it's one of those things. Is it's tedious and long term. Man, three months, I'm out. I'm yeah, out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Multiply your hustle, multiply your muscle. May all your shits be tapered. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell on Instagram and Twitter. Later. Shout out to all our sponsors, Ape Man Strong Apparel at apemanstrong.com. Bodybuilding.com for all your supplement needs. Compex USA for cutting edge muscle stim machines. Get 28 additional percent off with code POWERCAST. Increase your bench press at howmuchabench.net. Power, the only strength magazine available in both digital and print at thepowermagazine.com. It's Reebok.com, home of the Legacy Lifter. I'm the Jim McD on all the social media. You can follow us on Instagram. We are at Mark Bell's Powercast. We're out. <laughs>